during the democratic during the democratic primaries andrew yang brought up universal basic income ubi and made it central in his vision for the economy of the united states the theme was echoed by bernie sanders who cited this income guarantee such as offered by countries like Denmark and Finland as a possible model for the future development of the United States. Both Yang and Sanders argued that the automation of production and other technological changes taking place in America have created a lag in job creation even as the economy flourishes and that such a state can be responded to best with such a universal basic income. There are advantages and disadvantages to basic income that demand a thoughtful debate among citizens and in the media and in the halls of government. Such a debate is absolutely impossible in the current environment of oppression. What we have now is a universal basic income being forced upon us without any democratic due process or accountability. It is often known by the name of coronavirus stimulus check. The newspapers tell us that we may get another $100,200 in the mail soon if Congress passes the bill, or later, even more. But let us step, down, step back and think about this check for $1,200 that the government offers us. For many of us, the current shutdown has ended our economic lives left us unemployed. The stimulus check is the only form of payment that we receive. It is our de facto universal basic income, like it or not. But does this universal basic income allow us to be creative artists, to volunteer in our neighborhoods, to have financial security, or to spend the time with our children educating them and talking with them that they deserve. Will this universal basic income allow us to fully realize our potential? No, sadly, this universal basic income has been imposed upon us from above. Who knows who made up this idea? Certainly no one asked our opinion. We have no say in how much is proposed, or who gets it, or how. One thing is certain, for most of us, it is nowhere, anywhere near enough. And we also know that the billionaires and multi-billionaires have made a fortune during this so-called coronavirus crisis. They have gotten something far greater than some universal basic income. The debate on universal basic income assumes that income is the critical issue for Americans. No serious eco economist believes this fraud. The primary issue in American society, economy today is assets ownership, and assets are dominated by a tiny handful of the rich. The over-the-top response to COVID-19 has been used to intensely shut down the American economy and led to massive unemployment. This pre-planned controlled demolition of our economy has left us begging for some sort of universal basic income. Meanwhile, 
As the billionaires get billions more in subsidies, as CEOs rake in the cash, they do not need some basic income because they make their money off of speculation, off of the money that they print up by increasing inflation that destroys our money. That is what they steal from us. COVID-19 is, in a nutshell, a massive transfer of wealth. And unless that transfer is stopped, basic income will mean nothing. Most of us are starting to face eviction as our small stores are shut down by these arbitrary, illegal, unconstitutional regulations on our free movement. And no small number of us will eventually face starvation and poverty, homelessness and despair unless real action is taken. Giving us a basic income without addressing the massive concentration of wealth is a recipe for disaster. Doing so after creating an environment in which we have no choice but to accept those criminal charge, those checks is a criminal act. The super rich have spent the last 12 years and especially the last year printing up money using our Federal Reserve and giving it back to themselves. They print up money to buy back their own stocks and now they just print up money to finance their own speculation. We don't know how much, but probably between five and $15 trillion disappeared last year while we were distracted with repeated hypnotic corona reporting in the media. If we leave this artificially created unfair economy despair and, and disparity in place in the United States, if we let the looters keep their loot, the free money from the government that we receive as a paltry little check will not be free. It will be paid for with our taxes. Certainly not with taxes on multinational corporations with their headquarters over shore, offshore or taxes on those multi-billionaires. Taxes will create greater national debt, inflation that will destroy your buying power. We cannot grow food on our own anymore. We cannot produce our own energy anymore. And we cannot create our own clothes, furniture, and other products for daily life. For that matter, entertainment, culture, and even our exchanges with each other is also controlled by multinational, non-American corporations. We can only use the, the money that those corporations pathetically decide to lend to us to purchase products at big stores like Walmart that are also run by those multinational corporations. Produced, products produced overseas by poorly paid workers in a scam to destroy our economic foundations. The government has become the toy of the rich and powerful, high government officials, judges, and even mid-level officials are appointed with the backing of those multinational corporations and investment banks. The politicians are even worse. The actual experts in government have been removed and government functions, which are essential, have been outsourced to private corporations who do not, who do today what the government did 30 years ago, but with a focus on short-term profits for multinational corporations, not on the economic interests of the people. Those companies are paid with your tax dollars 
to do the job which should be done by a transparent, accountable government. But they never swore any oath to the Constitution, and their primary method, their primary mission, is to deliver profits to their owners, the super rich. This redistribution of assets, the complete transparency of government, the redistribution of assets, the complete transparency of the government, and the complete end of this unwarranted and dangerous influence of the rich and the powerful on the formulation and implementation of policy must end before any discussion about universal basic income. We need to consider why the banks want us to, cal to cultivate these habits of dependency and passivity, especially in economics. After all, if all we can do is sit around watching TV until our stimulus check arrives, we will not be able to organize ourselves into groups capable of taking action. We will not be able to build our own communities. Let us talk for a moment about the relationship between technology and this proposed universal basic income. Again, the argument advanced by Yang and Sanders was that automation and the growth of AI are reducing jobs because they're not, formed in, not being formed in the other sectors even as productivity increases. Therefore, we need UBI to assure that workers displaced by these new technologies will have employment and can adapt to new work reality. It is assumed that just as the sun rises in the east, the implementation of artificial intelligence and automation and the end of human to human interactions is a natural law like physics, like the law of gravity that cannot be violated something beyond any policy discussion. But if we are truly forced to tear apart the natural order of society in order to satiate the cruel God of technology, which demands endless sacrifice for the sake of some inevitable fourth industrial revolution, for the sake of the inevitable domination of the earth by automation, driverless cars, robots and drones, is this truly the kingdom come? Is this internet of things declared by natural or divine law? Is the promotion of artificial intelligence in accord with God's covenant with man, or is it rather perhaps a scheme to increase profits for the few and drive down the common man? the common woman, into poverty, and dependency? The answer to this question may not be obvious. It demands an open discussion involving experts on society, on technology, on governance, on economics, but above all, on moral philosophy. But also, including ordinary citizens like yourselves who understand better than anyone else what the impact of technology can be. Moreover, the discussion must be transparent and scientific in, in, in nature and method, leaving no space for the wealthy who benefit from automation and AI to disguise their wish list as some sort of scientific truth. Productivity without job growth is the standard line used to justify basic income. Productivity is the holy cow, the, saint, the false god that cannot be approached by any but the anointed high priests. A false concept cooked up to justify just about anything. It is not the law of gravity or the second law of thermodynamics. 
It is a biased and warped idea, a political statement that holds certain forms of economic activity to be more important than others. If you spend a day helping your sick mother, tending and growing vegetables in your community farm, volunteering with the handicapped, or playing and teaching your own children, that activity is not considered to be productive by those who make up these rules of productivity. However, if you destroy forests and homeland, or build unnecessary shopping malls, or rotaries and highways, if you poison rivers and lakes with a runoff from your factory farms or from uranium mines, if you wage wars abroad, or you build big factories overseas that unemploy tens of thousands of Americans, this is considered to be productivity. The gap between employment and productivity is most certainly not a product of technological change. Finally, if we need to consider where the United States stands in history at this moment and where we have come for, then we must talk about where we are going. In the previous generation, there was a profound ideological and economic competition between the market economies of the United States and Europe and the socialist economies of the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. We refer to that competition imprecisely as the Cold War. The United States held up the ideal that there was no limit to what the individual could achieve through his or her efforts. And we argued that individual freedoms were more critical than the common good. The socialist economies, however, assumed that economic equality was central for a healthy society and took preemptive measures to assure a relatively egalitarian economy and to fight the development of classes. I grew up in the United States in that period. We assumed that we could have economic fairness at the same time we had the ability to re obtain rewards in accord with our own personal efforts in an appropriate, fair manner. But we assumed to be that we assumed that this was a natural state when in fact it was not at all natural. The massive accumulation of wealth, the exploitation of workers, and the abuse of child labor had been standard practice in the late 19th century and even into the 1930s. But it was the existence of that socialist bloc out there, imperfect though it was, that put unending pressure on the United States to modify its economic and political system and to allow for a more just society granted the profound limits. In the early, in the late 1930s, the threat of revolution in the United States was so real that it forced real action on labor issues that would have otherwise been ignored. We, growing up, were not aware of that pressure, but it made things like real welfare and the minimum wage and legal unions, legal, uh, legal unionization possible. The salaries of CEOs were capped, taxes on the riches went up, taxes on the rich went up to 90%, and there were no billionaires or offshore havens to hide one's ill-gotten wealth. America was not that way because the rich were virtuous. It was that way because there was endless pressure from abroad and from at home. What was called a, a communist bloc was subject to commercialization from the 1980s on. It broke down for good reasons and the ideological opposition that it had offered imperfectly dropped off. 
the United States slowly shifted back over the last 30 years to the ruthless market economy it had once enjoyed, once one in which workers were expendi expendable. This time, however, automation and drones, robots and AI made it possible to engage in an even more ruthless experiment. The shifts in American society, like climate change, were too slow for us to grasp. We were too caught up with email and Facebook to notice either the destruction of our ecology or of our daily lives by multinational corporations. We could not perceive that the rules we had accepted before had vanished and that a ruthless, brutal, shining, brave new world had been born. Ultimately, we cannot discuss any universal basic income in the United States until we start to create a culture, a system, in which some counterforce exists to stand up for the interests of ordinary citizens against the super rich. This is the ultimate question. That counterforce, however, must be built by us, by me and by you, not by experts or politicians who are paid off by corporations secretly and most certainly not by corporations and their friendly investment banks with their drones and robots.